Good morning and welcome to Moncton Church on this last day of February. I don't know about you, but I sure am glad to see this one in the rearview mirror uh, between the ice and all the other things. Um, but anyway, it's great to see you all here this morning and you folks at home, welcome. Uh, we'll start with surely the presence of the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings, and I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we have reached our $500 goal for a manor house breakfast, so thank you all so much for your donations. We, we have $5 to spare, so I guess we'll start another one. Uh, the basket's on the organ, um, so, but anyway, thank you so much. Uh, that will be greatly appreciated by manor house. Um, for the food bank, we're close to our Jell-O uh, 60 how many boxes? 60 boxes. Uh, we're just about there. So thank you all so much. We need four more. Only four. We can do this. Okay, they're here. All right, we've, we've done it. Thank you all so much. Uh, that one's done too. Hey, we're on a roll. Um, okay, also for the food bank, in the bulletin, you'll see on the back of the bulletin some uh, immediate needs that they have. They have an ongoing list, but right now they really need breakfast things like cereal and pancakes uh, mix and syrup. Um, and they need kids, pasta, and canned meats. So those are the immediate needs for the food bank. Um, we also got a really nice thank you note from them. This is Baltimore North Cluster of Churches Food Bank. And they say, thank you for your very generous donation to the food bank. Because of your support, we were able to help a lot of our neighbors. May God bless you and give you his peace. Um, so that's great. Not only the uh, actual food donations, but the church and the UMW made a substantial financial contribution. So thank you all so much. And our candy makes that possible. Oh, I guess that's those individual things. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Chef Boyardee, kids pasta, that was the question. Things like um, ravioli and SpaghettiOs and things like that. Thank you for clarifying. Um, oh, we have something new. We're going, it's actually, it's not, it's, it's just starting this year. We've done this in the past. I gave each of you, and you people at home don't have this, but I will send one with the bulletin next week. We collect packets of seeds, vegetable seeds, for a mission called the Jackson Area Ministries. And they start community gardens that help feed people that are low-income people that need the help, and they also help individuals start their own gardens with the seeds. So seed packets, um, the insert tells you what they need. Starting next week, we'll have something on the organ where we can put those. You can buy them just about anywhere. The hardware stores have them. Um, I think even the dollar stores have packets of seeds. So um, that's our next thing, and the deadline for those is the first sun Easter, the first Sunday in April. Um, Tuesday Bible study continues this week, uh, beginning with Paul's letter to the church at Rome, 11 o'clock, Casimir, and on Zoom. Um, and finally, please continue to help the church with your tithes and your gifts. Thank you.
call to worship is Psalm 93 on page 813. The Lord reigns and is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed and is girded with strength. The Lord has established the world and shall never be moved. Your throne has been established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord is high, is mighty. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness benefits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Our opening hymn is, I was singing a song of Bethlehem, number 179. O oh, sing a song of Bethlehem, of shepherds watching there, and of the news that came to them from angels in the air. The light that shone on Bethlehem fills all the world today, of Jesus' birth and peace on earth, the angels sing always. O oh, sing a song of Nazareth, of sunny days of joy. O oh, sing of fragrant flowers' breath, and of the sinless boy. For now the flowers of Nazareth in every heart may grow. Now spreads the fame of his dear name on all the winds that blow. O oh, sing a song of Galilee, of lake and woods and hill, of him who walked upon the sea and bade the waves be still. For though like waves on Galilee, dark seas of trouble roll, when faith has heard the master's word, peace falls upon the soul. Oh, sing a song of Calvary, its glory and dismay, of him who hung upon the tree and took our sins away. For he who died on Calvary is risen from the grave, and Christ our Lord, by heaven adored, is mighty now to save. Please join me in the unison prayer. Generous God, our guide on life's journey, we can't imagine where we would be without you on our path. Sometimes before us, sometimes beside us, sometimes behind us, nudging us in the direction of the work you have for us. Open our hearts to respond to the needs of a hurting world. Make us your hands and feet, and walk us into places where people need you most. May we follow the path of Jesus wherever it needs to take us. Amen. Good morning. Okay, we're going to do something a little different this morning. Um, some of the virtual worshipers have asked if they could hear directly from you your God sightings, your joys, and your concerns. Now we tried this once before, it didn't work too well, but we're going to try it again. We may have learned from that. So I'm going to take, before we get into the, the existing prayer list, I'm going to take this mic and I'm going to go down, I'll start with Frank and Becky, and then I'm going to go down the aisle here. And if you would share your, your God sightings and your joys and your concerns, and Darren's going to try and follow up with the camera. We may just see the back of your heads, but uh, what, however that works. So I'm going to come over. I'm going to come over here. God sightings, joys, and, con and prayers of joy and concern. Frank, you got one today? Any any time I see anything going on, it's a God sighting. So it's uh, it's just a blessing. Okay, good. Becky. Well, um, I, my God sighting is my brother, Jeff, you all prayed for, is doing really well. He said he's at 85% better from his surgery, so thank you all for your prayers. Okay. 
I'll go down the aisle where all the people are. <laughs> Wendy? Well, I did get released for my uh, hernia surgeon so I can play pickleball again. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Wendy's playing pickleball again. again. For me, it's a God sighting every day that, because my son, Michael, lives with me and makes it possible for me to stay in my own home. Okay. Bill? Maggie? Hi. My God sighting is here with me today, and uh, we'll be together for the rest of our lives. Okay. Congratulations and welcome, Maggie. Thank you. Okay, we're here every Sunday at 10. Okay. So. <laughs> Uh, this is sort of a mix. Is it Joanna concern? Is schools open again? Um, prayers for the teachers and the students and everybody, but you know, just to take another step toward normalcy, I think, is a real God sighting. Towards the new normal. Toward the new toward normal. normal, yes. Right, John? I think it's a God sighting to see the snow recede each day <laughs> and not coming back right away. So. Okay. okay. Our virtual worshipers were able to share that as well. Uh, God is at work in our world, and God hears our prayers, and God responds to our prayers in God's time. We have a continuing prayer list. Uh, we're asking for prayers for James Yates, Nancy and Ted, our son Ken, I got a nice, night for, nice note from Judy Cage this week. She thanks you all for her prayers. Your prayers. Uh, she is doing okay, uh, but uh, her condition has remained stable, I guess is the best way to do it. But she appreciates, uh, we send her the, the text and the bulletin every week. And uh, so she appreciates that and asks for continued prayers for herself and Reed and Wendy and Libby. Continue to pray for Lisa and Claire. Jenny, we already have you listed up John is that okay continue to pray for Pat White Gary Monk is home and recovering uh, continue to pray for Pete as he recovers and for Mary who was lift, lifted up last week are there any others that would now come to mind if not then let us go to the Lord in prayer gracious and humbling God we come before you with all humility, with love, and with confidence. We see you at work in our lives, in this world, in this creation, each and every day. So we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your presence among us, for the guidance of your spirit, and for your salvation through Jesus the Christ. Be with us and continue to care for us. Continue to lead us in ministries that you would have us do to make the world the place that you would have it be. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who when he was with us taught us to pray with words like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is not the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you please join me in the prayer for illumination? May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. The first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah. It's a short one, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The second one, second reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. An angel promises the birth of Jesus to Mary. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she was said to be barren. She is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. The preparation hymn this morning is page 598, O Word of God Incarnate. O Word of God Incarnate, O Wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of our dark sky. We praise you for the radiance, for the hallowed page, a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age. The church from you, our Savior, received the gift divine, and still that light is lifted for all the earth to shine. It is the sacred vessel where gems of truth are stored. It is the heaven-drawn picture of Christ, the living word. The scripture is a banner before God's host unfurled. It is a shining beacon above the darkening world. It is the chart and compass that our lives surging tide, mid mists and rocks and quicksands to you, O Christ, will guide. O make your church, dear Savior, a lamp of purest gold to bear before the nations your true light as of old. 
O oh, teach your wandering pilgrims by this their path to trace, till clouds and darkness ended, they see you face to face. Please stand for the gospel reading. Good morning, everyone. The gospel is from John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. I hope I can see on this dark day. <laughs> the Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world was made through and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Please remain standing for the Gloria Patri. Please be seated. And will you pray with me, please? Gracious God, preferably through me, but if necessary, in spite of me, may your word be spoken and heard here today. For you, God, are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We are now in the second week of our six-week Lenten series on the Apostles' Creed. Last week, we explored that very short first statement, focusing on God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. There is a lot packed into that short phrase. It's a lot packed into that statement of belief. And there is much to be said about God. But one thing I didn't say last week is that I think it's fairly easy to believe in God. After all, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, and the vast majority of the world's populations believe in God or some gods. What sets Christianity apart from those beliefs is Jesus. And there are very specific beliefs about Jesus that are outlined in the second phrase of the Apostles' Creed which we're considering today. Some of those beliefs can be hard to accept, partly because, well, because we think we're so smart as human beings. Jesus' divinity, however, sets him apart from us ordinary human beings. There is much to be said 
in the section of the Apostles' Creed dealing with our affirmation of our belief in Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to address all of it today. There are 10 specific affirmations in that statement. And I'm going to focus, I think, on maybe one or two points of that that occurred to me as I was preparing this series. And it may have occurred to you as well. And again, this week I'm starting with Adam Hamilton's book on the Apostles' Creed, and I'm going to explore some of the things to come to mind from what we read there. The second and longest part of the Creed is this, and you know it. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and some traditions say he descended into hell at this point. And on the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. The earliest information we have about this person called Jesus comes from the 27 books of the New Testament, 27 individual documents that were written we think mostly between the the 50th year after Jesus' birth and the 95th. It includes the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written by Jesus' followers and were were drawing upon material from a variety of sources. And they, they provide a great deal of information about Jesus. And there's also some information in uh, documents that have not been included in the canon of Scripture but we're not going to deal with that today. The Gospels were written by people who had come to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, God's Son and their Lord. And they were written by and for Christians and for those who were open to receiving the faith. They paint a remarkably consistent and reliable account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. But... The Gospels are not the earliest documents in the New Testament. That honor belongs to the letters from Paul, written to small Christian communities across the Roman Empire. The first of those letters was written probably about 20 years after Jesus' death. So from all of this, scholars agree that there was a historical purpose, person named Jesus. And so believing in Jesus is not really a question. According to Bart Ehrman, an agnostic professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina, figure that one out, an agnostic professor of of Christian studies. Okay. Um, He devoted an entire book to examining the historical evidence for the existence of Jesus. And he said, whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, Jesus did exist. The Apostles' Creed is a statement of belief. It's not a historical statement as such, because it doesn't mention Jesus' ministry, his miracles, his relationship, and probably for me, most important, Jesus' teachings. Those are found in the Bible. The Apostles' Creed focuses on the divinity of Jesus and recognizes Jesus' humanity. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That is a statement, a a belief that has bedeviled people from the very beginning. Consider these words, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. It's an idea beyond belief for many because we're so smart. We know everything. If you're the parent, how many here have more than one child? Okay, when you, ha- when you had more than one child, did somebody ever say to you when you announced that you were pregnant again, you know what makes that happen, don't you? Anybody ever say that to you? <laughs> Everything we know about human procreation is contrary to the idea of a woman spontaneously conceiving. The Gospel writers Matthew and and Luke 
include the virgin birth, but it's really not emphasized in the Bible. So some believe it's possible to, to uh, be a Christian and not believe in the virgin birth, but even though it's something contrary to science, it can be incredibly easy to believe if you believe that the God who created everything and every person created heaven and earth, couldn't figure out how to make that happen. It'd be pretty easy. But we want answers. We want answers we can understand. We want answers to, we, to which we can relate. Even the youngest of us want answers like that. Darren, about 15 years ago, did you go with us on the bus trip to Sight and Sound? You did not. Well, your sisters did. They were, I don't know, five or six then. The church I was serving at the time uh, organized the bus trip to Sight and Sound up in Lancaster County uh, to see in the beginning. Um, in, in the beginning is a uh, Sight and Sound's particular spin on the creation narrative and has their own theology in it. Uh, so we, there were 40 or five, 45 or 50 of us on the bus, including Darren's mother and his two twin sisters, who were, what, five or six at the time, I guess. And we headed off to Sight and Sound to see in the beginning, with, of course, the mandatory stop at the ginormous buffet at Shady Maple. Everybody knows that one. Uh, can you imagine, if you've never seen In the Beginning, can you imagine what Sight and Sound could do with that huge theater, that huge stage, and all those animals with the Garden of Eden story? There were, there were horses and camels and birds, and there was everything <laughs> tromping around, not only on the stage, but out of the audience as well. But when the play got to the sixth day of creation, we were sitting on the left-hand side of the auditorium, and the character playing God, long white beard, long white flowing robes, the character playing God comes over to right in, right in front of us, no further away from us than Bill and Maggie. We were right down front and starts digging up like he's in a sandbox, playing in the sandbox. And sure enough, pretty soon, out of the sandbox, a man, Adam, arises. And the story goes on, that pretty impressive sight of God creating humanity from dirt. Made a strong impression on those twins, I gotta tell you. Because the first thing, the first thing that one of them said when we got back on the bus, she turned to her mother and said, Mommy, did God create me like that out of the, out of the dirt? Or did I grow in your belly like you told me? <laughs> we want, even from the youngest age, we want answers we can understand. And sometimes we can't. Sometimes we can't. Even the imagination of a six-year-old is challenged by what God can do. It is possible, is it not possible in a world where gods were thought to procreate with human women, that God might use that very idea, accepted by the people of the world, people not just of, of the Holy Land, but in Greece and Rome as well, as a means by which the Creator would bring forth God's own Son. Of course it's possible. Matthew 1, 23, quotes the passage we heard this morning. Look, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Maybe the reason that Matthew includes this story of the virginal conception of Jesus is a way of expressing that deep theological truth that God has come to be with us, that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and God did it. How precisely do you think Jesus was God. I got three movies in my notes today. 1977 film, Oh God. Okay, 
George Burns. Okay? <laughs> George Burns is God. 2003, Bruce Almighty, Morgan Freeman. And in The Shack, everybody here seen The Shack? A lot of people have seen The Shack, okay. The creator God appears first as a black woman, played by Octavia Spencer, and later as a Native American man, played by Graham Greene. God will be what God will be. God who appeared to Moses. And when Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? He says, I am that I sent me. Or I am that I am. Or I am what I am. However you want to translate it. God not only appeared in human form, but in Jesus, God truly entered our humanity. Jesus became one of us. Fully divine, but also fully human. Did God descend on him in baptism? Well, we heard that, we hear that story. Was he filled with the Spirit as he was baptized with the, with the Hebrew prophets? Or was he somehow both God and human from his birth? Those are mysteries that we don't know, and I'm not going to explore them today. But people have struggled to make sense of the incarnation of the deity since the very beginning of Christ. You're in good company if you worry about that. They struggled with it for 325 years until the council at Nicaea settled on language which has become the clarifying words of the majority of the church, what they believe, the Nicene Creed. That Jesus was God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Those words affirm what Jenny read a few minutes ago from the prologue to John. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the gospel. There are many words used to reflect the divinity of Jesus. The creed uses three. Jesus, Christ, and Lord. The name Jesus comes from the Greek, Yeshua, common name in the first century that is sometimes translated as deliverer or savior. According to Matthew 1.21, the angel told Joseph, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The Greek word for sin, most used most often in the New Testament, which was written in Greek, is hamateria, which means to miss the mark means that there's a mark that we're trying to hit, a path we're meant to follow, a way we're intended to live. I think most of us get this. We're meant to be loving, compassionate, just, merciful, giving, honest. As Jesus expressed it, we're created with two outstanding aims in life, to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Anything short of that is hamatria. We're missing the mark. We miss the mark when we don't love our God or love our neighbor. If you think about it, most of the world's pain and suffering is caused by missing the mark. Proof of human struggle with hamateria is readily available to anybody who observes huma humanity. Which of us have failed to do or say something that would help someone else? Jesus saves us from our sins. He's not just forgiving our sins, but affecting those of us who believe in him so deeply that we are changed by it. 
It involves a spiritual transformation that shows a better way and the ability to pursue it. You know, we don't want to just be forgiven over and over and over again, do we? We want to hit the mark. We want to be loving, compassionate, merciful. We want to do the right thing. I don't want to be blind to the ways that I can hurt others, intentionally or unintentionally. I want to see everybody for who they are. They're God's lovely, loving children. I want to find a way to act myself that way. Put another way, take a look at the front of your bulletin. Somebody pick up your bulletin. Congregational, congregational participation time. What does it say the mission of this church is? Right on the bottom front of the bowl. To know Christ and to make him known. That's what we're trying to do, isn't it? That's what we want to do. To make Christ and to make him known. With that, in our thoughts and our words and most important, our actions, we make Jesus known by living as Jesus taught us to live. Jesus came not just to save us from our sins, not just to offer forgiveness, but to change the way we act. He does this to, wants us to reorient our lives from the inside out, not be so self-centered, not be so self-absorbed, so narcissistic, and make us people who really, truly do love God and our neighbors. The, the creed also refers to Jesus as the Christ means in Greek, the anointed one. Word derived from the Hebrew, which means the same as Messiah, the ancient coronation ceremony. Anointed kings with, a, with an oil, with a particular preparation poured or smeared over their heads by the high priest. It means that that person was set aside by God and belonged to God to reign on God's behalf. And the word Lord appears 537 times in the Christian scriptures. I didn't count them. I've got a computer that does that. In Greek, the word is kairos. It means master or ruler or sovereign. It can also mean king. It means the leader of a city was the lord of the city. The lord was a, the king was the lord of his kingdom. The title used for Augustus Caesar was lord of lords, signaling the highest authority in the empire. So when the translators were translating the Hebrew and the Greek, they tried to find the right word. They settled on kairos. Jesus is not most frequently a Lord. There were lots of Lords. He is the Lord. The Lord. The point of all this is to emphasize that from the earliest times, Christians associated Jesus with God. Now the creed continues. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Asterisk in your, in your hymnal. He descended to the dead, or when he descended to hell. On the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Nobody really doubts that a person named Jesus from Nazareth, was crucified under Pontius Pilate sometime around 30 AD. It's pretty much accepted that he was hastily buried in a borrowed tomb and that a large stone was rolled over the mouth of the tomb. And we're going we're to talk about that in a few weeks because, my friends, Easter is coming. And when, then we, when we get there, we're going to also get to the, I believe, in the resurrection of the dead. If you're interested in more of those details, I have a couple of copies of Adam Hamilton's book that I'll be happy to, to loan you. But that's, those are the two points that occurred to me today that we should address. So to summarize, from Hamilton I'm going to quote, when God sought to communicate God's love for us, he sent Jesus. It was in his son Jesus that God sent this message to be our defining story. Through Jesus, God was saying, I am. You matter to me. I love you. To put it in simple terms, 
And I've probably quoted this before, so please forgive me for quoting it again. But one of the great theologians, Protestant theologians of the 20th century was a German named Karl Barth. He wrote a 13 volume, a 13 volume set called Institutes of Religion, uh, describing who Jesus was. And once he was asked, so it's a, it's a masterwork. Once he was asked to boil it down into one sentence, you know the sentence, it's in the hymnal. He quoted it from his childhood, his mother quoted it to him. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The Apostles' Creed, like Karl Barth's mother's song, is nothing more than a shortened version of the Bible. It tells us the essentials that sustain our faith in Jesus Christ. Not only is Jesus God's salvation and anointed one, he is God's Son and our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I'm going to announce, I'm going to dedicate the offering. Gracious God, you sent Jesus to be our Emmanuel, God with us. Take this offering that we go boldly give and send that word that God is with us through these works throughout the world so that all may come to know his love and his grace and his salvation. It is in his name we make this offering. Amen. <laughs> think. <laughs> <Yes. sighs> Got to do it again. We can't say this one. <laughs>
I told you we're going to do some things different this week. Please turn to page 881 in your hymnals for our commissioning. Everybody got it? You're getting it. You know this. You know this. Let's join in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Third day, he rose from the dead, descended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Calamistic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, my friends, go. Go in peace and live those words. Amen. Thank you.